Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today's video is all about rhetorical strategies, specifically which strategies are the most common in AP Lang question two passages and SAT essay passages. We're gonna talk about how to identify these strategies and how to analyze them more effectively in order to improve your essay score. The first strategy we're gonna talk about is logos, which means logic. So we see this in a variety of ways, specifically evidence, data, facts, even conditional sentences, like if this happens, then this will happen. Basically, logic is reason. So it's important not just to say, oh, the author uses logos or the author appeals to logic. That's part of it, but you actually need to expand upon that and examine what the logical deduction is. Why is what the speaker is saying logical and how does this logic further his or her argument? One example of how a speaker has used logic to convey his or her argument is found in Susan B. Anthony's speech in which she advocates for the right of women to vote. So notice that she says it was we, the people, not we, the white male citizens, nor yet we, the male citizens, but we, the whole people who formed the union. So here we see evidence of logic because she's taking this phrase and she's alluding to the constitution, we, the people, and she is breaking down the semantics to say that the Constitution does not say we the white male people or we the males, but rather we the people. And so her argument becomes that if she is in fact a person, which she is, then the phrase we the people should apply to her and therefore she should be able to vote. And not just her, obviously, but women in general should be able to vote. So she breaks down the language of a very famous, very foundational document and then uses that language to bolster her own argument. And so therefore it's a very logical appeal. And this is important because in the time, you know, women were deemed the inferior gender. And so women were also seen as emotional beings and not logical beings. And so men were logical, women were emotional. And so in order for her argument to have ground and to have merit, it's important that she relies on logic instead of another strategy that we'll talk about later, which is pathos or emotion, because men would not have listened to an emotional argument. And so she needs to prove that she is equal to men and therefore equally as capable of being logical and well-reasoned. And so therefore, she must use logos here and not any other strategy, not pathos. Like She can't use an emotional appeal here because that would essentially disprove everything that she is trying to prove, which is that women can be reasonable and rational and therefore they should be able to vote because they can make informed and logical decisions. In this example, we see Kennedy appealing to logic because he is using concrete figures, concrete dollar amounts, concrete time periods in order to justify the increased spending on space exploration. So what students would say here oftentimes is they would say like, oh, he's appealing to logic because we have concrete dollar amounts and he's using facts. Well, what we need to do is actually extend that a bit further. So why do these dollar amounts matter? Why does it matter that he's being very specific about how much the spending has increased over a designated period of time? Well, the answer is that we are in the space race at the time of this speech. And so America is a democratic nation and we are trying to get to space and put a man on the moon before Russia does. And Russia is a communist nation. So there's actually this implied patriotism here. So if we concede that space exploration is necessary, and it is necessary because we need to put a man on the moon first, and why do we need to do that? Well, we need to do that because we're America and we need to be the best and we need to do this before Russia does because if Russia does it first, then it means communism, communism is better and we're a democratic nation, so we need to prove that democracy is better. And so if we can concede those things, then we can justify all this spending. And so if we want to put a man on the moon, then we need to spend money to do so. So there's the logic. The next strategy is ethos. Some people pronounce it ethos. 
and it is credibility or ethics. More often than not, I see it used in the form of credibility when I look at AP language and SAT passages. Because ethos is a, an appeal to credibility, one of the classic markers of ethos is the presence of first-person pronouns. So in this case, we see I. I implemented, I have. And so George W. Bush is talking about what he has done as commander-in-chief. So it's an appeal to his credibility because this is a speech that he gave after 9-11 and so th he's trying to reassure the public. And so by talking about what he has done in the aftermath of this terrorist attack, it shows that he is competent in the situation, whether you agree with that or not, because of your politics is not up for debate right now. But he's trying to prove not only his competence, but the fact that he and the military at large are going to handle this situation and he's working with Congress and as our leader of the time, he is going to make sure that the people responsible for this attack serve the, the justice that they need to serve because of the loss of American life. And so by saying I here, it appeals to his credibility. And based on the actions that he's talking about here, we are reminded that he was the president and therefore he has the authority to make these decisions. So this appeal to credibility is an, also an effort to reassure the public that justice will be served and that they're in good hands and that as a country, we are going to unite and rally and he is going to lead that charge. When talking about pathos, which is emotion, it's important to recognize which emotion the author appeals to. Specifically, is it fear? Is it nostalgia? Is it patriotism? It can be any number of emotions, but when you say the author appeals to emotion or strikes a chord with the readers or any kind of phrasing like that, sometimes those get a little bit cliche, but... When you talk about that emotional appeal, you need to recognize what the specific emotion actually is. So let's take a look at a couple examples. Looking at the same speech from before, the 9-11 speech from George W. Bush, we see an emotional appeal here. So notice the words that are in purple. Those words have positive connotations, whereas the words in pink have very negative connotations. So we see juxtaposition here, which is a strategy we'll talk about later. But as a whole, this passage appeals to patriotism. So there's an emotional accord here because the phrasing strikes a great deal of sympathy within the American public for the victims of this attack and for their families, but it also calls forth this sense of anger, this sense of wanting justice, and this sense of patriotism here. So there are multiple emotions at play, but overall, one could argue that this is an appeal to patriotism, this idea to inspire the public to unite and to then seek justice for those who lost their lives because of these terrorist attacks. In this example, we see a different type of emotional appeal. This time, it's not an appeal to patriotism, but rather just more of a nostalgic feel. So nostalgia is when you reminisce on the past. And so we see two strategies present here. And I think this is an important example because it's important to realize that strategies can work together. So in the blue, we have an anecdote, which is a strategy we'll talk about later. And this anecdote creates a sense of nostalgia. But then we switch to a fact, eight out of 10 children. And then later on in that paragraph, there is a call to action, which I'm actually going to talk about in part two of this video series. So please notice that the strategies can work together within one paragraph. We can have multiple things to talk about. And so sometimes writers balance the presence of, you know, an emotional appeal and a logical appeal. In this case, he starts with an emotional appeal, a nostalgic appeal, because it makes him more relatable. So most readers hopefully will have had some sort of experience camping or just out in nature where they've experienced this darkness. And so they will then be able to see this fact of eight out of 10 children and realize that there's a problem here, that future generations are not going to have this 
natural darkness. Now that sounds like a random concept. Like, so what? Like, most people are afraid of the dark anyway. But what he later argues is that we are so overcome with artificial light that we don't have this natural darkness and it affects our health. It affects ecosystems. And so we have this emotional appeal and it's a very, very short anecdote, but it serves to connect with the reader because most people will read that. And even though they might not have been to a lake in Minnesota, they might have some sort of connection. Like, you know, maybe they were a boy scout and they went on a camping trip, or maybe they had a farm in the middle of nowhere and it it was really dark. Who knows what the connection is, but it resonates with the reader just enough. And then we have this fact to back it up. And so we see two strategies here, uh, actually technically more than two strategies, because there's a whole lot more we could say about this paragraph, but we see two strategies working together. So please don't think that it can be only logos or only ethos or only pathos. Oftentimes they work together but the thing that we don't want to do is we don't want to constantly be looking for all three because oftentimes when students look for just logos, ethos, pathos, and they try to find all three in a passage, then they're making these connections that aren't necessarily there. And instead, they're overlooking some other really important strategies. So logos, ethos, pathos are the rhetorical appeals that are sort of like the framework of instruction. And they're perfectly valid to use if used correctly. But there are usually other strategies present. So when you see pathos, for example, there's usually something else going on that you could also write about. And so we're going to talk about some more rhetorical strategies now so that hopefully you can see how these things all come together. The next strategy is one I already briefly mentioned, which is an anecdote, and that is basically just a very short story. They're often interesting or amusing. Sometimes they're a cautionary tale, but they are used oftentimes to, in conjunction with ethos. Oftentimes it's a personal anecdote. It doesn't have to be personal, but it allows the speaker to connect with their audience and to find some sort of common ground through a quick story that ultimately supports the purpose of their speech or their text as a whole. Anecdotes are actually quite common in AP language passages, so it's important to be able to identify this strategy and to be able to examine its significance in context of the passage itself. So in one of my previous videos, I actually analyzed the Lady Mary prompt from 1996. So this was quite an older passage. And then there's also a more contemporary passage that I use with my students quite frequently, which is from the 2013 exam. And that one was by Richard Louvre. And so it doesn't matter if it's an older author or a newer author, or if it's an older passage or a newer passage, the strategy of an anecdote is quite common. And so therefore it's important to realize how that strategy is functioning in the text. In the case of the Louvre article, the argument he tries to make is that we as a society are disconnected from nature. We don't appreciate nature anymore and we are so overrun by technology. And so in this anecdote that he gives, it's actually not a personal anecdote. It's just a regular anecdote because it's not about him. He tells the story of how a friend went to a car dealership and the dealer was shocked that she did not want a DVD player in her car. And so the assumption that we get from this is that society as a whole values technology. We want DVD players. We want phones. We want to stay connected. But in staying connected, we're actually becoming disconnected from nature. And so there's an implied call to action here this idea that we need to solve this problem because we're becoming so overrun by technology that we don't appreciate the natural resources that we have. And actually, quite frankly, some of those natural resources are depleting. And so we no longer sit in the backseat of a car and just watch the trees go by. We want to watch a movie instead. And so he uses this anecdote as a social commentary to further his argument that we are very detached from nature. And if we don't do something about it, then we will be condemning future generations to this um, disconnected state. So in our efforts to stay connected, we're actually disconnecting. And so all of that comes out of one simple anecdote. It's like a tiny portion of the whole passage that co the college board gave for that exam, but it's very impactful to his argument. <laughs> 
Another very common strategy is juxtaposition. Now, there are a couple strategies that are a bit more specific, things like antithesis and paradox, but I think if you just understand juxtaposition, that's enough because there are different subcategories of juxtaposition, but it's okay just to say the author juxtaposes or even just the author contrasts. So basically, if the author is using opposite topics side by side for some sort of point and you have to figure out what that point is, then chances are it's an example of juxtaposition. So let's go ahead and look at a couple examples of juxtaposition to make sure that we understand what to look for. This excerpt from A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens is one of the most famous examples of juxtaposition. So notice the words in blue. Those words have positive connotations and the words in yellow have negative connotations. And so each of these words is contrasted. Best of times, worst of times. Wisdom, foolishness, belief, incredulity, light, darkness. Those are all opposites. So it's juxtaposition. And oftentimes students read this and they think, well, wait a minute, how could it be both of those things at the same time? And is this a paradox? Well, to give a little bit of context, this novel is about the French Revolution. And so for some of the population, it was the best of times because the wealthy were very, very wealthy. And the poor were very, very poor. So for them, it was the worst of times. And so both things, though opposite, were true. And that's what Dickens emphasizes here. In this example, we see juxtaposition within a poem. So we have the speaker imploring his father to rage back, to fight back, not to go quietly. So basically, he's saying, like, don't die. Like, don't leave me. Fight back. Fight harder. And this contrasts with the norm, this idea that one will go quietly and just sort of like give in. If you're elderly or sickly, you'll just kind of slip away into the night. And the speaker of the poem does not want his father to do that. He wants his father to live. And so we have an emotional appeal here as well. So this is further evidence that strategies don't have to be examined in isolation. And so if you can identify the juxtaposition here, but then also realize that it's an emotional appeal, then that's a stronger analysis than just looking at the juxtaposition. Or if you saw the emotion and not the juxtaposition, then the combination of the two is stronger than looking at these as singular strategies. So just kind of keep that in mind that strategies are not totally independent of each other. They work in tandem to make a stronger piece. In regards to repetition, I think the biggest mistake that students make is they say something like, the author repeats, and then they have this word or phrase as textual evidence, to prove his point, or the author repeats this for emphasis. And yes, repetition is for emphasis, but which point is he trying to emphasize and why? And so if we stop short of the why, why the repetition is meaningful, then we haven't done the analysis justice. So we're going to look at examples of two different types of repetition, anaphora and epistrophe, to talk about why this particular type of repetition is actually significant to the text as a whole. Anaphora is the repetition of a word or phrase at the start of successive clauses. So it can be an independent clause, it can be a dependent clause, but it's the repetition at the beginning of that clause. Now, we already looked at the juxtaposition within this example, but now I've highlighted the phrase it was. Notice that the phrase it was is at the start of each of the clauses here. So this is an example of anaphora. And so what we would need to do here, if we were writing an essay about this, is talk about both the juxtaposition and the repetition. So it creates a rhythm here. The anaphora creates this flow. The repetition of it was makes us think about the word was a little bit more too. And so it's past tense. And so that could be significant. And also it gets us in this rhythm that helps emphasize the contrast a bit more. So by repeating it was, we as a reader then pay more attention to what comes next. And Obviously, Dickens is a very verbose writer anyway, so we have probably more contrasting pairs than what 
a contemporary writer might find necessary. And so by doing this, we he's contrasting like different facets of life to prove that it was quite good for the wealthy, but it was also quite bad for the poor. And so the juxtaposition here, but also the repetition through anaphora really highlights exactly how good it was for some and how bad it was for another. And if he had just left it at that first sentence, um, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. If he had just ended it there, that would have been an interesting phrase, but it wouldn't have carried as much weight um, if because that would just be juxtaposition. But when we have this anaphora by saying it was, it was, it was, then it really ingrains that into the reader's mind. It really establishes this dichotomy between the rich and the poor. And that is something that one must understand in order to understand the, not only the novel, but like just the premise of the French Revolution in general. Here's another example of anaphora. This one's from Winston Churchill, and he repeats the phrase, we shall. So it's this idea of like, we must, and there's almost this implication of we will. And by repeating this phrase, he instills patriotism within the audience. And so we've got, again, this example of anaphora, and this time it's not juxtaposition, but we see more of an appeal to emotions. We've got pathos going on. So when we have anaphora, the repetition becomes meaningful when we realize that there's something else present to make it meaningful. So in the previous example, it was the juxtaposition. In this example, it's this appeal to patriotism. Epistrophe is basically the opposite of anaphora because the repetition comes at the end of successive clauses. I personally find that this is significantly less common, and I think we see anaphora much more. So I think it's good to know what epistrophe is, but to be honest, it is not as common. I just think it's good to know that there is a phrase for the opposite of anaphora. Rhetorical questions are one of the strategies that students often find very quickly if it's present in the text. And that is because one, there's a question mark, so the punctuation is very clear. But two, I think students are pretty familiar with this idea that a rhetorical question is simply just a question that the speaker asks or the author asks, and they don't intend for the audience to actually verbally answer, but rather the idea behind it is to get the audience to think. And so we just need to explain what the audience is supposed to think about. Is the rhetorical question a call to action? What is the writer needing this pause for? And so when we examine rhetorical questions in order to get to the deeper meaning, we need to realize that while there isn't an expected answer, the audience will sort of answer in their own mind. And so perhaps it's being used as this mechanism to support the argument by giving the audience pause to then agree with what the speaker is saying. So the audience member or the reader depending on what the genre is, feels like he or she is coming to his or her own conclusions, but in actuality, they're being a little bit manipulated with this rhetorical question. Here we have just a really quick example of rhetorical questions used in The Merchant of Venice. So if a rhetorical question is a question that does not get answered, what is it called if there is an answer? Well, there's actually a strategy for that, and it's called hypophora. And basically, this is when the speaker poses a question and then immediately answers his or her own question. In this example, we see Barack Obama pose the question, so what does middle class economics require in our time? And then he immediately answers it. And in his answer, notice that he appeals to ethos as well because he says, my budget will address each of these. And so he offers a question and then offers an answer. And his answer serves as a solution. And by giving that solution, he restores the faith of the people and he exudes confidence because he has an answer to this problem and therefore the use of hypophora actually enhances his credibility on the matter.
In this example, we see a second instance of hypophora. This is actually from Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. So one of the things that I think is important to realize is that it's okay if you call hypophora a rhetorical question in an essay. And it's okay to say the author poses a rhetorical question and then answers it because hypophora is actually sort of this obscure strategy. And so it's not like you're going to be docked points if you don't use that term. So while it's valuable to know it exists, I think it's really more important to understand why the author is posing a rhetorical question and then examining whether or not he or she answers that question because there's a different effect. If we just pose a question, but then we don't answer it ourselves, we want the audience to come to a certain answer in their own mind. However, if we pose a question and then we immediately answer it, we're controlling the narrative much more tightly. And so that's what we see with hypophora. All right, guys, that concludes part one of my rhetorical strategies video. I hope you found it helpful. If you did enjoy the content, please go ahead and hit the like button so that I know that this is something you want to see more of. And if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell because I am coming out with a part two of this video next week where we look at an entirely different set of rhetorical strategies that are also fairly common in various types of writing. And so if you want that help, make sure that you don't miss out on that video because my goal is not only to help you identify these strategies, but also to teach you how to analyze these strategies within the passages that you see them so that you can write a more effective essay on either the AP Lang question two essay or the SAT essay. All right, guys, I'm Coach Hall. Until next time, happy writing.